Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> children of all ages, <laughs> may I present P.T. Barnum. My name is Molly. I am the research librarian here at Monterey Lake Library. And tonight we're going to talk about our buddy P.T. Barnum. And we're going to put you back in that yesteryear machine. And we're going to think about times when there was no radio, <laughs> no TV, and no streaming. <laughs> So, yeah, I know. Sorry, it might be a little frightening. So he was born July 5th in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1819. His name is Phineas Taylor Barnum. So the Phineas and the Taylor come from his mother's father's name. So that, but they just called him Taylor so as not to confuse <laughs> with the grandfather. So he became an icon himself. He became part of the entertainment, very recognizable character after a while. He was known for what they call humbug. He was known as the Prince of Humbugs, and we're gonna get into what that means and how he got there. So, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, they had this saying, and it was called Yankee cuteness, which means sarcastic, like an acute angle, very sharp. And the whole town was pretty much of this species where they would play jokes on one another. And his grandfather and some of the guys from town, they were stuck on a boat they were supposed to come in with a cargo and the grandfather says, hey, let's just shave half of our beards off and see if anybody says anything. So this is the setup of the town and everybody's like this. And they play a lot of jokes on him. He takes them pretty good naturedly, but that's probably where he gets the idea to really put on a show. So he's a king of promotion and we'll get into that too. He's probably the first person to really do like a publicity blitz. He might have invented it. He had a lot of jobs before he reached his circus days. I'll talk a little bit about that. So, born July 15th, 1810. And he's most widely known as an entertainer and entrepreneur of the 19th century. He's an icon of American ingenuity and king of promotion. The story is fascinating. It has to do with social, commercial, political, and even industrial history. He's a big figure of the 19th century. And his tale begins long before that circus. In fact, he didn't team up with Bailey until he was in his 60s. So he had a whole lot of life to live before then. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So he was gifted Ivy Island, right? And it was a piece of property that everyone in town said he was the richest boy in town. And when he was younger, he, he couldn't make it out to this Ivy Island because he was too small. He couldn't wait till he was 12 and make the journey. And the whole town is like, you're going to inherit this Ivy Island, and it is fantastic. So little P.T.'s imagination's going, and he's saying, oh, I'm going to build a big farm there, and I'm going to make my way, and I'll have a big house, and it'll be great farmland, and hills, and valleys, and awesome things. So he dreams up this wonderland of this island that he's inherited. The richest boy in town and everyone in town tells him you're gonna be the richest boy in town. You're inheriting this thing. So he gets out there when he's 12 and guess what kind of island it is? It's a swamp. <laughs> it is worthless. And the town still keeps jabbing him. You're the richest kid in town. But it was that Yankee sharpness, <laughs> the Yankee cuteness. So the whole town was like that. Now, he was very industrious. So in the War of 1812, he sold 
cherry rum to the troops, which he made himself as a young man. He worked in his father's store. He sold lottery tickets. And what you did back in those days, you had to have a license from the state in order to sell these lottery tickets. And it was all involved, but he had it down. He, he could sell tickets like nobody's business. He really made a good profit on that. A little older, he bought a bar, he ran it, and he sold it for a profit. He started selling fruit as a business when he was done with the bar, but he secretly marries this charity Hallett, and she's a seamstress. Now, how many have seen the greatest showman movie with Hugh Jackman? Okay. For those of you who have seen it, in that movie, it's her parents that object, but really, it's Barnum's mother objects. She thinks that that girl is not good enough for him, so that's why they're marrying in secret. So she does come around after a while, but it's, you know, nobody's good enough for my boy <laughs> kind of thing. He also started a newspaper and it's called the Herald of Freedom, and he starts writing articles that criticize the elders in the town, the elders in the church, and then he gets sued for libel, actually from one of his distant relatives end up suing him. So he spends two months in jail for the libel. But when he comes out, there's this big parade. Ooh, Barnum for freedom. Look, look what he did. And then there was this big dinner set up, you know, supposedly spontaneously. And it was at this hotel. And really, the town was so small that you'd have to have advance notice to have 100 people come <laughs> to this hotel restaurant. So he never admitted to it, but it might have been his first big production. <laughs> So anyway, he also opened a board, boarding house at a grocery store, but what he was really looking for was his first exhibition. Now, what happened in these towns when there wasn't any radio, TV, streaming? People would take a human oddity or an animal or they have these boxing matches and they'd just come to your town and perform and sell tickets. So he was looking for something to make his way. So he wanted an exhibition and he wanted, you know, start making money that way because he sees what these other guys are doing. I can do that. I can do it better. Okay. So I'll get into that. Now, he secretly married Charity and then he had four daughters, and unfortunately, one of them passed away when she was two. And then, when his wife became ill in her older age, she had a nurse. And her nurse was this Nancy Fish, whom Barnum married shortly after the wife passes away. And can you guess how many years younger she was to the 78-year-old Barnum? Come on, take a guess. 64. <laughs> 40. Man, nobody's winning a prize tonight. <laughs> um, but if you think back of those times, it wasn't that unusual. It just seems like a bigger gap than most people with the 40 years, but yeah. So let's get into, I'm going to get into the context of what it was like in the 1820s, 1860s, right? So besides all that no electronic stuff, there was no electricity in that town either. So can you imagine how dark it was? Pretty dark, right? No electricity in New York. You know, not wire to wire. They hadn't wired the houses up yet. So, in New York, where he eventually moved at this time because he thought he could make a better profit. New York's the big city, right? Always was, always is, right? So, when he moved there, 
in that time period. So the seats in the theater increased like 20 fold in the little theaters and stuff. And theaters were thought to be kind of like stay away kind of thing, but he had an idea that maybe he could make them more family oriented than they were. And the newspapers increased like a crazy amount and you didn't have to have a subscription. They were the penny papers. So you got all these people around selling so newspapers and Barnum sees his chance because he knows how to write newspaper articles and he's going to advertise whatever exhibit he ends up getting in all the newspapers real cheap and you know I'm going to advertise and write letters to the editor and so forth. So he's going to use take advantage of all of the penny press papers. So during this time and after the Civil War, American culture became more popularized, like more for middle class and very popular entertainments, things that would appeal to more people. And then that culture went abroad to like England and Europe and so forth. So whatever entertainment we were doing here, whatever music we were doing here, kind of transferred. It's the reverse of the British invasion <laughs> of the 60s, right? So that kind of puts you in there. And entertainment was mainly local. Like I said, they would take these traveling places and they would go from town to town with whatever exhibit they were showing or whatever. But it was mainly local. So your little town is just where you performed and and it was local. It wasn't like, of course you couldn't show it on TV or anything, so it wasn't national. It was just local, just right there, right? So by the time, by the age of 25, Burnham had tried working many jobs. Like I said, uh, the lottery, uh, worked in the store, boarding house, and he thought, I had long fancied that I could succeed if only I could get a hold of a public exhibition. And he reflected about that on his life and times and autobiography, Life of Barnum, written by himself, of course. So there's two sides of every story, and two things can be true at the same time. He's an entrepreneur, he's got all these businesses, he's got a museum, he's an urban developer, he's a philanthropist, he's a temperance leader, a politician. On the other side, he, he could exploit human beings, he was a hoaxer, shameless self-promoter, sham artist, accused of abusing animals, and also a politician. So depending on your view of politics, good or ill, it's on both sides of that equation, right? So let's talk a little bit. We're going to talk about his first exhibition. Now, this lady, her name is Joyce Heth. She was an enslaved person, very elderly. Her hands were all wrapped up from arthritis. She couldn't walk, but she could talk. And she was promoted as being the 161-year-old nanny of President George Washington. <laughs> and Barnum wanted her. <laughs> now, here's where it gets a little funny. So in New York, it was against the law at that time. Slavery was against the law at that time when he was 25 and he wanted to have her in his exhibition. So it's kind of funny, did he rent her or did he own her? So that one's still up in the air. I mean, he might have fudged how he acquired her. So he wanted to bring her to Manhattan and he put her on display. And what he did for the promotion was, now Remember how I said no electricity, right? So he had taken these waxed papers, huge waxed papers with her photo on them, saying absolutely amazing. And what he did was they were lit from behind with lanterns. 
So it kind of glowed, it had like a, like a day glow thing in the night, you know, so it, it really impressed because they're huge, they're glowing, wow, cool. So it's gonna be a great show. So she is the absolutely astonishing and interesting curiosity of the world. She was said to be 161 years old and um, mm, mm, perhaps not. Uh, what she would do is sing hymns and tell stories about the baby Georgie, right? That was part of her display. And what he had done also besides these giant advertisements, this was advertised in every newspaper he could get a hold of it, would look like this, right? And he would go and, you know, they'd pay for the show and whatnot. So what somebody did, maybe him, he's, he himself probably, wrote a letter to the editor saying, she's a fake, she's a wax doll made of Indian rubber and mechanical. Come see for yourself. So what he had done, generated the interest, they saw her once, and they had to come back to see if that was real or not for themselves, so how many times they pay for that? <laughs> He's a pretty good marketer. Is he a great showman? Good marketer, hey, we'll give him that. Okay, so that's our Joyce. This next thing might be a little frightening, just saying, just bear with me. This next exhibition may not be what you're expecting. This is the Fiji mermaid, all right? See that poster there up top? Mm -hmm. Fiji spelled exotically. He knew how to spell Fiji, I'm sure. Fiji mermaid, come see, oh, it's a real mermaid. These sailors found her, right? So, how would you feel? How would you think? What do you think a mermaid looks like? And what would you think if you saw that? <laughs> right? Right? So he got, people to see it and and then some people were a little disappointed some people thought it was funny they thought it was like you know one of those yankee cuteness um years later they found out it's actually a baboon skeleton sewn to a fishtail but i don't know about you i don't think i'd be too happy that a hoax like that was played on me because you're thinking one thing and it's that but you know, that's what he did. And so what he did with this before he displayed her it thing was he offered to give every newspaper in town an exclusive on the story of the Fiji mermaid. And every paper in town published it thinking they were exclusive and it resulted in some free publicity, right? Oh, we all got this exclusive story, woo -hoo. And it was free publicity. Pretty smart, right? So people came to see this thing. They want to see it, just crowds and crowds. And then there were some lectures by a Dr. J. Griffin. He was a naturalist at the British Museum of Lyceum. But there's a couple problems with all this, right? Problem number one. Griffin was actually a Barnum hire named Levi Lyman. Problem number two. British Museum of Lyceum did not exist. And the mermaid was actually that. Three little problems. Yankee cuteness, right? But now he's got ideas. He's got bigger, brighter ideas and the showman is born. So his rules of being a performer or having exhibits or being the showman is be original, right? Don't play it safe, like by hiring an enslaved person in, in the Fiji mermaid. No, that is so gross. Anyway, 
There's a customer born every minute. Now, people say that he said there's a sucker born every minute, but there is no proof of that. In fact, I think it was W.C. Field. <laughs> Similar, but not, anyway, there was no proof that he actually said that it was not attributed to him. Um, I could not find any resources that actually said that, but you skyrockets. Give people their money's worth. Now, would that be your money's worth? Is it Fiji? I'm, I'm still on that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Use the power of the printer's ink, and boy, didn't he. Here's your exclusive story. And persistent advertising. Yeah, blitz that out, get it everywhere, put flyers in everybody's hands, something in, you know, newspapers. So that is what he came up with. Okay, so there's this museum for sale. And Barnum buys it. And he renames it Barnum's American Museum. And it's pretty boring on the outside, right? So first thing he does, it gets flags from a whole bunch of countries and he puts them around, 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 and then one big American flag. And then he puts those big posters up of what he's showing next. So that's big and flashy and kind of like if you've ever seen a picture of like outside a news organization and they got their newscasters and they're huge, that kind of thing he's got going on there. So he ran this American museum from 1841 to 1868 and it offered some strange and educational attractions. It had performances, there was a little theater down in the bottom, and some were extremely reputable and some not so much. It offered a zoo, a lecture hall, a museum, a wax museum. It had the theater and a freak show dioramas, panoramas, scientific instruments, modern appliances, a flea circus, a loom powered by a dog, an oyster bar, a rifle range, glass blowers, taxidermist, pretty baby contest, Ned the learned seal, a menagerie of exotic animals, and you know what, there were beluga whales in that building, like in a big aquarium couple beluga whales. He also had Native Americans perform songs and dances. He had Grizzly Adams with his trained bears. He had musicians, ventriloquists. He had people performing as minstrels, adaptations of Bible stories, and even Uncle Tom's Cabin was performed in that little theater. And at its peak, the museum was open 15 hours a day, and as many as 15,000 visitors a day, so some 38 million paid 25 cents admission to visit that museum between 1841 and 1865. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So, besides all of the zoo and the wax museum and so forth. He had human attractions. Now, it wasn't unusual in that day to have what they called human oddities, or freak show is not a nice word, but that seemed to be a thing that people wanted to entertain or be educated about. And, you know, he didn't lose any speed on that at all. So, human curiosities. Now, in his later age, he showed some regret for some of these, but I'm only gonna cover a couple of the more controversial ones. So this guy, what is it? He would have big signs saying, what is it? What is it? What is it? Now remember, Darwin was doing his thing theory back in these days. So what is it? So he's got this person dressed up like that and the first version of what is it, somebody found it out because it was an actor friend of his and somebody had seen him in something else. And no, <laughs> that's an actor. Well, this guy. So the second version of this was an African-American man who's named William Henry Johnson. So 
his mother, he, he was a, uh, his mother sold him into show business at a young age. So he was between four and five feet tall and he appeared to suffer from an abnormality where your head is kind of thinned in and small for your body. And they also nicknamed him the pinhead. Not very nice, right? <laughs> By today's standards. But remember, we're back in the 1800s. So <laughs> right? Are you thinking about who's a pinhead right now? Mm -hmm. Who you would call a pinhead? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, although Johnson was not the first in the role, um, he was one of the more popular exhibits. And, you know, it's the cultural context that the exhibit appears helps explain the fascination for human beings and evolution and those kind of things. Right? Right. Anybody recognize our General Tom Thumb here? Yeah. Um, he was one of the more famous performers, I will say. He actually ended up sparking out on his own and making a lot of money. So he was one of Barnum's highest paid ones. And Barnum met him when he was five years old. And he was smart smart kid, right? So Barnum teaches him to do somersaults, tricks, he can impersonate Napoleon, <laughs> he can do a lot of things. So Barnum takes him under his wing and trains him up, you know, before he's going to show him, and gives him that name General Tom Thumb, and it's after that nursery tale, child's tale about Tom Thumb, because he's small. But he was only five when he met him. So when he was born, he was nine pounds and eight ounces, and he grew normally for the first six months. And his parents grew concerned when he stopped growing by his first birthday. So by almost five, he'd only grown one inch, right? So they took him to the doctor, everything seemed fine. And so when Barnum found him, he contacted his parents and he taught them to sing and dance and rhyme and he contracted with those parents so he could be a performer and actually he was one of the biggest draws you know of the museum which comes in comes in uh, very popular so he did his first tour of America at age five and he impersonated Cupid and Napoleon and Barnum billed him as age 11. So why do you think he might do that? Make him seem smaller <laughs> and older because it's not really cool to be running around with a five-year-old and all the work he was doing, right? His second tour, he went to Europe and he became an international celebrity. And who did he get to perform for? Queen Victoria, yes. So his name was actually Charles Stratton, but you know, of course he gets renamed for show business. And before he started performing, these human curiosities were thought to be dishonorable and seen unpleasing carnival attraction, but this kid, he was gold. He, he, he upped the game and people started to see it as more of an entertainment than just looking down on people. So he really made that uplifted in society. So in 1863, he married LaVita Warren at the Grace Episcopal Church and the reception was held in New York City at a big ballroom. And what they did with Mr. and Mrs. Tom Thumb is they put him up on a grand piano so then the reception line could, you know, see them and they could see everybody. So they put them high up. So there were 10,000 guests, 10,000 guests that came through that reception. Okay, now I've got a quiz. Does anybody know what this word means? Do you know what that word means? Is it an exotic animal? Is it a tigress? No. Is it an egress? Guess 
what that word means. It means exit. Now Barnum was getting kind of fed up with the amount of people that just lingered on and on in that American Museum. And he's like, you know, these people are here all day and they're only paying one admission, 25 cents. So how can I get them out of here and make them pay again? So he put signs that said this way to the egress. And what it did was lead people around the corner and out the back door, which shut on them into an alley. So they had to pay their 25 cents again if they wanted to continue to be there. Because <laughs> not everybody knows what egress means. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about Jenny Lind. Now, she was an opera singer, 1849. And what Barnum was looking for here was to make his stab at legitimate entertainment or a higher class entertainment than his little museum with the things. And plus he saw a lot of profit maybe coming his way with this Jenny Lynn. So he approached her with a proposal to tour the United States for 150 concerts in 18 months. Can you imagine that? Wow. I mean, I think Elvis was doing that at one time. <laughs> Realizing they would yield large sums for charity because she gave her money to charity, particularly she was from Switzerland, so she gave her money for free public schools in her country. That's what she did with her profits from this tour. I don't think Barnum did anything like that. So, 1850, Barnum had some advanced publicity for her and he went crazy. Things in the papers, everywhere. So by the time she came on the boat, there was this totally crazy frenzy, and they called it Jenny Fever, okay? And when her boat came in, 40,000 people were waiting at the dock for her. Just crazy, just people everywhere, and they could barely get her out of the boat to take her to the hotel. But he went crazy with the publicity. He even sold some of the concert seats at auction. So it became a big deal, you know. That was a hard commodity. Hey, you know, any auction them, of course, profit. But then it became, you know, the upper class is like, well, that seems scarce and I'm going to bid on that. And nobody's for sure if he put his own folks in the crowd to get that bid up. We're not sure. So. After her first two performances in New York, Lynn's party toured the East Coast. They went to Cuba and Southern USA and Canada. And by early 1851, Lynn had become uncomfortable with Barnum's relentless marketing of her tour. So she had a clause in her contract that she could quit him at any time. And she did <laughs> because she couldn't take it anymore because he's just like selling, 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 and she's like, enough. So under Barnum's management, Lynn gave 93 concerts in America for which she earned $350,000 and he netted $500,000. So her money was 10.9 million in today's dollars and his was 15.6 in today's dollars, a lot of money. And of course, she donated hers to various charities and Barnum, not so much. But he did build a real big house. And there it is. So after touring Europe and seeing all the architecture and things there, he built what he called Iranistan, and this is his big mansion, right? So it has Byzantine, Turkish, Moorish architectural types. It had t stables, tree specimens, fountains, just wonderful things. It had numerous porches, arches, and the whole thing was topped by multiple onion domes and a circular driveway and a curved around the fountain. And it had a greenhouse that he would, Barnum would gather a lot of flowers for, for Sunday service. And Barnum imported 
choice livestock at the property, and he would let people tour the grounds. You know, it was like a big garden park. And it also <laughs> was kind of used as free publicity because look at this great big house and Barnum's letting us, you know, on his ground. So it's, you know, it helps him out. But the sad thing is that that house ended up burning down. So before this house burns down, Barnum had started buying up a bunch of stuff, stuff for that museum. He was buying other museums. He bought a couple circuses, their menageries. And the problem was that in order to purchase the real estate, Barnum bor borrowed a lot of money from various investors. So, <laughs> Despite his good intentions of trying to develop the Bridgeport area by building his museums and circuses in the area, he borrowed much too much money than he could pay back. And as a result, he's bankrupt. So he starts out buying a lot of stuff way above his means, borrows a lot of money, he borrowed more than he could pay, and he goes bankrupt. So what he ended up owing in 1855 was 500000 to his creditors, which is $17,434,000 today. Wow. But Barnum was able to successfully work his way through that. He's paying things off, and he was able to repurchase Iranistan back from who bought it. So he was able to purchase it back, and then, unfortunately, he let his insurance payments on that house lapse. And then there was a fire, and it burned to the ground. So and, and nobody was hurt, and family wasn't hurt, they'd save some furniture or whatever. So he was kind of disenchanted at that point, and he ended up selling the rest of the land in the grounds because he just couldn't go back there after that. So he got through all that, and then he went on a tour. Now, he wrote four books, and we'll talk about the books that he wrote. And then, just prior to his circus days, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened to the American Museum. You're going to be surprised. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, there were two fires at this museum. So, on July 13th, 1865, New York's most popular and morally questionable museums burned to the ground. So this is before he teamed up with Bailey. What had happened was, according to an account by the New York Sun, at noon on July 13th, a museum employee came running up from the basement and announced that the office was on fire. And the flames quickly spread through and soon smoke bellowed into the building. A fireman quickly evacuated visitors, human performers, and animals from premises. And by 1.30 p.m., so we are at noon to 1.30, the roof collapses. And one of the building's walls soon followed. And miraculously, no human lives were lost in the blaze, but many animals perished, including those two whales. And what's sad is they boiled alive in that fire. So it's just horrible. Um, there was rumors that a lion escaped from the museum and was roaming Manhattan. Nah, didn't happen. But rumors are good, right? So it was gone, and so was the museum. And then he rebuilt. So he tried to reopen. But once again, the new building burns down. Seems a little suspicious. Could say it was an insurance job, maybe, maybe not. So it had a 24 year run, the two incarnations of that museum, 30 million visitors at 25 cents a piece. <laughs> wow. You can see some things today if you go to barnum-museum.org and there's some remnants of 
stuff that was collected from the museum days. So what's he going to do? Hmm. He's got some circus animals. Let's see, and the railroad moving, so maybe he could rent that space and maybe open another business. He's got some circus animals and other things, right? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna open Barnum's Monster Classical and Geological Hippodrome. So what's a hippodrome? See the movie Ben-Hur? You know that racetrack? going around? Well, that's what he ends up building. And he puts an open air tent over it. And that's where he's performing with the circus animals, right? And it's right near where Madison Square Garden is today, right near there, right around the corner. So when New York constructed the new Grand Central Station, he rented out this building. It had bench seating. And they did circuses and other performances, and sometimes those horse races. And then, Barnum's tired of not traveling. He's got the travel bug in him, so he's got a little bit of his circus animals, and he goes on a little tour. And then he meets up with Bailey. Ta-da. So it is the greatest show on earth. But remember, he's in his 60s now. <laughs> so he teamed up and they were really great together, good partners and had the circus train. and They had a lot of great acts. And of course, those beautiful, beautiful posters. They are collector's items now for sure, but that was a good way to advertise. See how bright they are and you're on the midway and you got these big posters so you can see where you're going, what you're gonna see. So much fun. Now we're gonna address the elephants in the room, right? Anybody hear a jumbo? Big elephant, right? Might have been where Dumbo got his name, not sure. Anyway, there was a lot of cruel treatment of animals back then, but, you know, man has dominion over the beast in these days, in the 1860s, and, you know, they're just dumb animals, so this is how we're going to train them. But P.T., he charted a ship to steal some elephants from their homes and families in Sri Lanka. So he took nine elephants, including one calf, and they were forced into a cramp ship hold for four months without any fresh air, without being able to move. So they're stuck in there, but only one reportedly died. But those are pretty brutal conditions, right? So, let's talk about Jumbo. Anybody got a guess at how Jumbo Jumbo was? How big he was standing? Come on, come on. 10.6, there you go. He weighed over six tons. So he was 10.6 feet tall at the shoulder. So if you counted his head, maybe <laughs> he would be 10. So hey, good guess. So, Jumbo didn't start out here, of course. He started out in France, he was part of the French Zoo, and then he moved on over to England, where Queen Victoria and family and kids were entertained by rides, by Jumbo. But somebody wanted him. P.T. Barnum wanted him. Oh, yeah. And School children wrote letters to the queen asking, don't sell him, don't sell him, but he was sold. And poor Jumbo, he didn't want to go. He slumped and he's kind of like downhearted. And it was kind of a national, international controversy. So he bought Jumbo for $10,000. A lot of money, big money back in those days. Big money. So, became an international 
kind of scandal there. And the reason why is that the keeper kind of thought that Jumbo was a little ill-tempered and he might get angry and sometimes he had some aggression and might cause a public catastrophe. <laughs> so in New York, Barnum, Exhibit, exhibited him at his hippodrome, yay! And he's earning enough in three weeks from the enormous crowds to recoup the money that he had spent to buy the animal. And in a 31 week season, the circus earned 1.75 million, largely due to the star attraction. Now, you see that top picture there? Brooklyn Bridge? Right? Very recognizable. See all those elephants on there? Well, here's what happened. So on May 16th, there were rumors that the Brooklyn Bridge was about to collapse. Now there were people on there. And somehow this rumor spread. And the crowd goes crazy. And there's like a big stampede. And one woman fell off during this stampede that they thought it was falling down. Now, I don't know what started the panic, but they thought it was gonna fall down. So the next day, in order to prove that that bridge was sound, Barnum comes and he has 21 elephants march across that bridge to show it's sound, so you think it's pretty sound <laughs> if you've got 21 elephants coming across. So let's talk about him as a writer. Now, he wrote four books, and one of them is his fantastic autobiography by himself. And when he wrote it, he kind of gave away some of the hoaxes and how he was, you know, I don't know if he was trying to brag or what, how he got away with these hoaxes, right? Well, the press didn't like that. They thought he was insulting people's intelligences and how dare you and what a humbug. And so he ends up, the, the third book in, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting his autobiography until he comes out a little nicer. <laughs> so every version of it, he's a little nicer and he leaves stuff out because bad press. Now, the Humbugs book is interesting because he's known as the Prince of Humbugs, but back in those days, they had all kind of fortune telling, seances, those kind of things, people trying to steal your money here and there. So his intent was to educate people. These are the scams and tricks that people are trying to pull on you, and here's how to avoid them. This is what's going on with those kind of things. Things like witches, ghosts, supernatural stuff. So then he rewrites his autobiography and he renames it Struggles and Triumphs. And he talks about his successes and his hoaxes and his frauds, but maybe in a nicer tone about himself, so <laughs> he avoids some of the heat. And that last one, The Art of Money Getting, it was a guide for prosperity and it offers practical advice rather than get rich quick schemes. So he's telling people that to find the right vocation and avoiding debt is finding what you're good at, right? That's, that's the way he believes. And remember what we talked about earlier, there was both sides of the story and that last thing was pol politics, politician. So we're gonna go into that a little bit. So he was a member of the C Connecticut House of Representatives he became mayor of Bridgeport. He was a speaker and lecturer for temperance. He was part of the abolitionist movement. But that didn't mean that Joyce Heth and what is it didn't come back to haunt him because they go, oh, what about this? What about putting these people on display? You know, you're pro 13th Amendment and you're doing that. So it, he never quite lived those displays down. But he did a lot of good. Um, he did get to vote for the 13th Amendment. Um, by the time you see him in the circus days, he's total teetotaler, and he actually went around and got people to sign the pledge because he's a salesman. He got his friends, his neighbors, everybody, right? 
So he was excited that he got to vote for the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And his statement, now put it in context of the times, this is his quote, a human soul that God has created and Christ died for is not to be trifled with. It may tenant the body of a Chinaman, a Turk, an Arab, or a Hottentot. It is an immortal spirit. So, so when he was working as mayor of Bridgeport, he worked to improve their water supply, and he brought gas lighting to the streets, and he enforced the liquor and prostitution laws, and he was instrumental in starting Bridgeport Hospital and he was also the hospital's first president. But what he called it was profitable philanthropy. Do those words go together? <laughs> he says, if by improving and beautifying our city of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and adding to the pleasure and prosperity of my neighbors, and I can do it at a profit, the incentive of good works will be twice as strong as if it were otherwise. So, <laughs> good for me, good for you. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Tufts University. So he was appointed to the Board of Trustees even before it was open, and he made several significant contributions to the institution, including a $50,000 gift, which was the equivalent of $1 million. He also, in 1883, established a museum later known as Barnum Museum of Natural History. Not like that fake one, remember, about the Fiji mermaid and that fake British. <laughs> this was real. And Tufts University made their mascot is Jumbo. And their also team is known as the Jumbos. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit you with some Barnum quotes and then we're gonna talk about what happens. So Barnum says, unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature, and best suited for his particular genius, he cannot succeed. The plan of counting the chickens before they are hatched is an error of ancient date, but it does not seem to improve with age. Politeness and civility are the best capital ever invested in business. Nobody ever lost a dollar by underestimating the taste of the American public. <laughs> well, look at what he was shown. <laughs> Let your motto then always be excelsior, for by living up to it, there is no such word as fail. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Work at it, if necessary, early and late, in season and out of season not leaving a stone unturned and never deferring for a single hour that which can be done just as well now. The great ambition should be to excel all others engaged in the same occupation. My inexperienced friend, take it for granted that they all tell the truth about each other and then Transact your business to the best of your ability on your own judgment. The foundation of success in life is good health, that it sustained fortune, and it also the basis of happiness. A person cannot accumulate a fortune very well when he is sick. Fortune always favors the brave and never helps a man who does not help himself. So, Barnum, passed away of a stroke at home in 1891, aged 80. He is buried at Mountain Grove Cemetery in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it's a cemetery that he actually designed. And can you guess who else is buried there? Haley? Tom, Tom Thumb is there too. So, yeah. They're near each other there. 
Okay, so that was the presentation. Anybody have any questions? Did his daughters um, inherit his wealth or did he die? Actually, <laughs> let's think about the 1800s, right? He was, he had no male heir, so he gave the money to his grandson. Yeah, <laughs> but think of the times. <laughs> We're in the 1800s, right? Um, also, for his first wife, Charity, she didn't really like all that travel and all the things, so his eldest daughter would go on some of these tours with him because she was more of the hostess and she would like to stay home. So they were kind of opposite in that respect. And tragically, while Barnum was touring Europe with Tom Thumb, his two-year-old daughter passed away of an illness, but did he stop touring and come home? No. But he always said he regretted not spending much time with his family, and he would for a little while, but he just couldn't get over that travel lust and wanting to be the center of attention to the point where people recognized him. Now, if something seemed off or a joke or a prank, they would say, where's Barnum? And that meant, you know, <laughs> Barnum should be around because he pulled this thing, you know. Yes? The uh, people that he had, like Tom Thumb and those people, did he pay them well? Or was yes. It was it kind of a tight one? <laughs> no, he actually paid Tom well, Tom Thumb very well. Um, the other exhibits, not a lot. In fact, the one that was the bearded lady, um, she died in poverty, and it's tragic. So he paid some better than others. Some of them were able to strike out on their own and also make other money, like side money, like he let Tom Thumb go out on his own and make some extra money to the point where, remember when he went bankrupt there for a bit? Well, Tom Thumb was like, I can bail you out. <laughs> You know, he, he was willing to help pay the debtors. And, you know, Bailey's like, no, no, no. And he got his way out of it. But, yeah, some were paid better than others. And a strange thing about that bearded lady, too, was... Ugh. So when she was on display, um, you know, she was a big draw for a while at the American Museum. And somebody wrote an anonymous letter to the newspaper saying that that was not a woman, it was a man, and it is a hoax. So somebody actually went and sued the museum saying this is a hoax, whatever. So then that poor woman had to be examined by a doctor to prove that she was a woman. <laughs> so the indignities, but hey, 1800s, you know. Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, there was a tragic train collision of the Barnum and Bailey train. There was also a, a circus tent fire as well. Um, lots of fires. I don't know if that's coincidence. <laughs> it's, it, I'm going to say it's coincidence, but lots of fires around Barnum, right? Any other questions? All right. Thanks for coming out tonight.